many of you participate in academic meetings where you're introduced by someone. Uh, with Stephen's absence, I have to introduce myself. And I rehearsed this with my wife this morning before I left, and I was going to do something like this. We're going, James Boffman is, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm a former director of the school. Uh, I teach, along with my, my colleague and friend Steve Vaughn, the history of mass comm class here. Um, I'm actually a, a political historian by training. But the other awkward thing here is because there's no moderator or chair here, I'm going to rely on my producer, Wendy, to give me the signals as to how much time I have left. Because at the end of 9 10, I'm going to thank myself for giving the talk. <laughs> and then another panel is going to come up, which will be much more interesting than the talk you're about to hear. Um, so here goes. I want to thank Stephen Ward for inviting me to talk today. As some of you know, it's very hard to say no to Stephen. I was trained in history, but you don't have to have had a degree in history. And you might have even slept through the undergraduate survey course you took in U.S. history to know that American newspapers were very partisan in the 19th century. Editors, wrote one historian, unabashedly shaped the news and their editorial comment to partisan purposes. They sought to convert the doubters, recover the wavering, and hold the committed. The power of the press, one contemporary journalist candidly explained, consists not in its logic or eloquence, but its ability to manufacture facts or to give coloring to facts that have occurred. Party newspapers in the 19th century gave one-sided versions of the news. Papers in opposition to Andrew Jackson's election in 1828 attacked him for marrying a woman before her divorce had been finalized. They had made an error. They, they did not realize at the time they wed uh, that Rachel uh, was, not, was still, in fact, married to another man. Uh, his uh, critics in the press accused him of being the violator of marital virtue, a seducer. Jackson, one paper declared, tore from a husband the wife of his bosom. Pro-Jackson newspapers insisted on the general's innocence and accused his critics of violating his privacy. There was no objective middle ground. Stories that might flatter the opposition went under, unreported or underreported. As one historian of the 19th century uh, politics observed, the truth was not suppressed. It was simply not to be found in any one place. When Democrat Grover Cleveland won the presidency in 1884, the Republican Los Angeles Times simply failed to report this unhappy result for several days. <laughs> Newspaper economics partly explained why, as one veteran editor observed in 1871, the press was bound to party. Before the Civil War, parties actually subsidized the operation of many newspapers, sometimes directly through government printing contracts. In many cases, the subsidies were indirect and unknown to readers. Editors or their reporters worked part-time for state legislators or members of Congress. Some of these relationships continued late in the 19th century. Needless to say, they were not terribly ethical. Journalism historians, including our school's founder, Willard Blyer, regarded the party press as a bad thing. Blyer fervently believed newspapers had an obligation to educate the citizenry on matters of public policy. A biased news medium was bad for a self-governing people. Although Blyer reflected the views of several generations of journalism historians, more recent work has broken with this consensus. Gerald Baldesty and others argue that the party papers encourage democratic participation, that they treated readers as citizens and voters, not passive observers. Declared the Worcester, Massachusetts spy in 1832, go to the polls and see your neighbor goes there and vote for the men who have always been faithful to you and your interests. And voter turnouts, especially in the northern states, reached record levels, over 80% in 1856. The more objective, detached journalists that Blyer favored may have done their job too well. By examining politicians too closely, Thomas C. Leonard suggests, the press left voters feeling helpless, even cynical, regarding the electoral process. Why bother? 
The percentage of voters turning out for elections dropped sharply in the 20th century. That is, once most newspapers ceased being party organs. An average of about 60 percent voting in the last three presidential elections. And it was lower, of course, through most of the, 19, most of the 20th century. At the same time, scholars like Baldesty contend that the decline of the partisan press is not explained, as Blyer would have hoped, by a more responsible professional attitude among journalists and editors, many trained in the new schools of journalism at Madison and elsewhere. Baldesty contends that commercial factors encourage many newspapers to become less partisan. The cost of publishing a daily paper, especially in the largest cities, began growing to the point where party subsidies no longer covered operating expenses. Even more, the presence of new revenue sources, specifically department stores and other retailers, more than made up for the old party subsidies. Yet these new advertisers all but insisted that editors expand their reach and be less partisan. Such consideration drove most, though not all, newspapers to present the news more objectively. Newspapers did not march in lockstep, especially in the 1930s when the Chicago Tribune made no effort to disguise its distaste for Franklin Roosevelt. There were other holdouts, including for many years, the Los Angeles Times. Still, I would argue that by the 1950s, most newspapers, large and small, as well as the broadcast networks, tried to present the news objectively. What factors, in effect, closed the deal? The relative neutrality of broadcast journalists was explained in large measure by federal regulations that all but mandated fairness. But there were other explanations as to why our national news culture, whether print or broadcast, preferred the middle ground. The middle ground in the middle of the last century was more populated. That was something else I forgot to announce about cell phones, but <laughs> turn them off. <clears throat> And lunch is at noon. All right. <laughs> the middle ground in the mid-50s was more populated. By that, I mean partisanship in the 1950s was less intense. This was in some degree because the Cold War had created the consensus on foreign policy, and much of the Republican Party had accepted the outlines of the welfare state created in the 1930s. Even Robert Taft, the Republican Senate leader thought to have the best 19th century mind in the upper chamber, favored federal housing programs. Eric Goldman, the, the great historian crack, quoted someone saying what was, the party seemed so similar in the 1950s. Goldman asked someone, what, what, how do you explain the difference between Republicans and Democrats? This won't work for some of you who don't drink. Uh, but uh, the, the response was, uh, when a Republican makes a drink, he uses a jigger, a Democrat just pours. That's the difference. <laughs> Those of you who didn't get it will need to talk to your parents uh, later <laughs> or, or your alcoholic friend. Anyway, in the late 1960s and 1970s, we began to see a greater division among our two major political parties. The Vietnam War fractured the Cold War consensus, mainly among more liberal Democrats. We had a much more active debate about the fundamentals of U.S. foreign policy. At the same time, conservatives slowly became more conservative and began to increase their influence within the Republican Party. Moderate Republicans as a species all but vanished. Uh, a more conservative Republican Party challenged some of the premises of the welfare state, and more recently, labor policies, as well as the progressive income tax. At the same time, mainstream news, larger metropolitan daily papers and the network news, lost some, if not most, of their authority. Part of that loss was due to a change in what constituted objective news presentation. This is something Stephen Ward wrote about so ably in his first book. Reporters were increasingly encouraged to add more analysis into their stories. Such analytical reporting, more often than not, did not have a liberal sense, of, you know, more often than not, I would say, had a liberal cent centrist slant. It was not hard liberal, uh, not Rachel Maddow liberal, uh, maybe neoliberal. And my, my reference point here is Herbert Ganz's wonderful study of four major news organizations in the 1970s. But if you look, as I have, at the New York Times in 1960, and then jump ahead uh, to 2010, you're struck by how much more stenographic the Times was 
1960 as opposed to now, how much more interpretive the Times reportage is now than it was then. Now this more analytical journalism could be very off-putting for those on the fringes, especially on the right. Uh, one reader's analysis is another reader's opinion. 60% uh, of those surveyed by the Pew Research Center in 2009 reported uh, that they felt political reporting was politically biased. 60%. There is, there is a related problem that editors note and I encountered when I, uh, when I gave public service talks as director of the journalism school. A lot of people can't distinguish the editorial page from the rest of the paper. They assume the worst, that the editorial views of the newspaper inform the rest of the document. Now various missteps by the mainstream media did not help. For many of those opposed to the Iraq war, the New York Times' mishandling of claims uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction in 2003. For Republicans in 2004, the flaws in CBS News' reports about President Bush's and his military service. Now, news organizations have always made mistakes, but they have greater consequences when consumers have somewhere, somewhere else to go. A safe harbor. Safe harbors became visible in 1987 when the, with the end of the FCC's Fairness Doctrine, which empowered Rush Limbaugh and a much more opinionated talk radio. Then in 1996 came Fox News, soon followed by the internet with websites and blogs. All provided conservatives safe harbors for their worldviews. There were safe harbors as well for those holding more liberal views if we look at Huffington Post a year ago or so and substitute MSNBC for Fox News. Has partisan journalism returned? Yes, but only in part. We need to remember that most Americans don't watch Fox News or MSNBC. Limbaugh claims to have the largest audience of any radio show host, but most of us aren't listening to radio when Limbaugh's on, okay? Most Americans on a, day, on a given day do not listen to his program, or view Glenn Beck. Most Americans are not fierce partisans. Independents are the largest block of voters in the United States. Let's look at the numbers. Much has been made of the declining popularity of the network evening newscasts. Katie Couric, the anchor of the CBS Evening News, has to be feeling a bit like Captain Smith of the Titanic. Her newscast reached what, was the, New York, what the New York Times reported Monday as a record low of 4.89 million viewers in August of last year. Well, again, according to the Pew Research Center, Couric still drew roughly a third more viewers than Bill O'Reilly, and almost four times what Keith Oberman was averaging in 2010. Although the audiences for the new party press should not be exaggerated, we should acknowledge that its fans are more likely to be politically engaged, or as Louis Menand wrote in 2009, people who need an ideological fix. The new partisan media can inspire or simply reassure those resting on the ideological fringes. If you belong to the Tea Party, you have Glenn Beck. If you think the Koch brothers are trying to purchase the state of Wisconsin, you have Ed Schultz. You have a safe harbor. So have we gone full circle? Is it 1850 all over again? I think not, perhaps not even halfway. In contrast to the factious newspaper culture of the mid-19th century, today's media culture is in fact divided between the new partisan media of the radio, internet, and cable, and those news outlets that still endeavor to report the news seriously. They won't, for example, provide platforms for those who insist that the president was born in Kenya, or that the Bush administration was behind the destruction of the World Trade Center. As I noted, the serious or adult journalists still have the larger audience, but can they keep it? And more to the point, does the larger audience really pay the freight? Roger Ailes brilliantly understood this when he founded Fox News. Uh, Ailes anticipated an argument that Joseph Thoreau made subsequently that the media business model was changing. Advertisers who had once pressed newspapers to covet a mass audience and be less partisan we're now in search of niche audiences. The successful media entrepreneur, Thoreau tells us, whether publishing a magazine, 
or creating a cable channel went after subgroups of viewers or readers. In the case of Fox News, cultivating a niche audience of 60-something conservatives. Ailes also recognized that news gathering is far more expensive than opinion spouting. It is far cheaper to produce a show from New York than to send reporters like the center's very own Anthony Shadid into harm's way. And consumers of cable news understand this difference as well. When France, Britain, and the United States launched airstrikes against Libya several weeks ago, viewers turned to CNN, not to Fox. Alas, we cannot count on new military interventions to prop up CNN's ratings. So should everyone remain calm? After all, America survived the fiercely partisan press of the 19th century. We don't require a passport when we go to Florida. Well, we, that's, yeah, think about that. <laughs> we survive, but just barely. The robustness of political engagement in the 19th century could not prevent the Civil War and eliminate slavery peaceably. I am not sure that Blyer and others were so wrong to condemn the party press. As in the 1850s, Americans have to make tough decisions, not ones fortunately involving something as evil as slavery, but still difficult choices about our future. Fiscal crises on the state and national level require some compromise, the finding of common ground. The new partisan press, consumed so lustily by party activists, makes finding that common ground seemingly impossible or much more difficult than it was a half century ago. And our political culture, as in the 1850s, has become deeply dysfunctional.